uh, with your tithes and offerings. Um, we're going to do something today that we don't usually do. Actually, I don't know that we've ever done this before, uh, but because of the fast-moving events of the week as it relates to uh, Egypt, we're going to be looking at and actually uh, devoting our time to Bible prophecy today. Uh, towards the end of last week, I was sensing from the Lord that he was leading me to devote the entire uh, Sunday morning teaching uh, to uh, Bible prophecy. And uh, what I did, and I usually like to make a habit of doing this, I uh, took the posture of just waiting on the Lord to confirm that he was indeed prompting me to do this instead of our ongoing study in Romans. I don't like to uh, preempt, uh, so to speak, our uh, study through the Word expositionally as we go through a book of the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But uh, when I was in prayer yesterday morning, I received what I like to call the green light uh, from the Lord to uh, devote today's teaching on Egypt and uh, Bible prophecy. So uh, would you join with me as we go to the throne and pray and ask God's blessing on our time? Loving Heavenly Father, we would ask that you would settle our hearts and focus our attention. Lord, we want to hear you speak to us and minister to us. Lord, we need for you to keep any distraction away that we might be enabled to hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit as you speak to our hearts the truth and reveal to our hearts your love. Lord, we commit this time to you and ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I uh, chose the title for today's prophecy teaching, <clears throat> What Egypt's Prophecy Means to Me. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 83, but before you turn there, we'll start where we left off last week for the benefit of those who weren't with us last week. Uh, because of the Super Bowl, <clears throat> and uh, you know who you are. <laughs> Welcome back. It's great to see you again. <laughs> but last Sunday, we uh, looked at a prophecy concerning Egypt that's found in the 19th chapter in the book of Isaiah. And we actually looked at the entire chapter, but uh, what I'd like to do today is begin by revisiting Isaiah chapter 19, just the first four verses. <coughs> you can follow along, <coughs> pardon me, with me as I read. Uh, Isaiah chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. I think this will be a good place to start. We'll sort of lay the foundation and then springboard from this platform. The prophet Isaiah records a prophecy concerning Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud <coughs> and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt within them. I, verse 2, will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Brother will fight against brother. Neighbor against neighbor. City against city. <coughs> Pardon me. Kingdom against kingdom. Verse 3, the Egyptians will lose heart, and I will bring their plans to nothing. They will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. I, verse 4, will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master, and a fierce king <coughs> will rule over them, declares the Lord Almighty. It's this pastor's belief that we have just witnessed and may continue to witness this prophecy in Isaiah 19, verses 1 through 4, fulfilled in real time. Now, I am keenly aware that I 
could be wrong, but it does seem to me that verses 1 and 2 could continue to play out as they have heretofore. Egyptian rising against Egyptian and uh, kingdom against kingdom. And really Isaiah prophesies a civil war in Egypt in the last days. I believe that it's possible that verses 1 and 2 could play out and give way to the fulfillment of verses 3 and 4. It's very possible that their plans for freedom, their fighting so hard and protesting for freedom will come to nothing, as Isaiah says in verses 3 and 4. And subsequent to this, and as a result of this, God will hand them over to a cruel rule of a fierce king. Now, some suggest that this cruel master this fierce king that Isaiah prophesies about is none other than the Antichrist himself. Uh, personally, I think that's very plausible. And the reason I think that is because it does seem that the world is now begging for a leader to come and take his place on the world stage. There does seem to be now this setting in motion of the fall of these governments starting in Tunisia, and please don't forget Lebanon, and now Egypt, they're without a leader. There's a vacuum, if you will, that has been created, and I see this as not being static, in the sense that it will sort of spread throughout the entire Middle East, I believe, by design. So it's creating now this scenario whereby the world will be very accepting of a world leader who could indeed be the Antichrist himself. And that interpretation does seem to fit with the other prophecies in the scriptures. Uh, we looked at one of them last week. It's found in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, verses 42 and 43. Daniel records, he, speaking of the Antichrist, shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he, verse 43, shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the interesting Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Uh, interesting detail there in that both Libya and Ethiopia are mentioned in the prophecy found in Ezekiel chapter 38. If this is where all this is heading, and I believe it is, then it becomes very likely that the situation in Egypt has potentially fast-forwarded the rapture. Now, I know that you know, you know that the rapture is my favorite topic. And if I didn't teach the Bible expositionally, book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse, I would teach it topically. And every Sunday I would teach on the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, I know that you might be thinking, well, here, here he goes again. He's going to talk about the rapture and the, how it has to happen before the seven-year tribulation. And you're right. <laughs> I sort of have to. And I know that to some it might seem sort of sensational, but I got to say that both Isaiah and Daniel's prophecies concerning Egypt describe how that she will ultimately come under the cruel rule of the Antichrist. And if what we see now leads to the fulfillment of Isaiah 19 
and Daniel 11, as we just read, and the fulfillment of Isaiah 19 and Daniel 11 will ultimately find its completion in the tribulation and even at the end of the tribulation and the rapture is before the tribulation and we're seeing things now that will be fulfilled in the tribulation then how close is the rapture consider the apostle paul's letter to the church in thessalonica it's his second letter it's chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 and he writes by the holy spirit and says let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, speaking of the rapture, will not come unless the falling away, keep those two words falling away in your hip pocket for just a moment, we're going to come back to them. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of Perdition, again, speaking of the Antichrist, who, verse 4, opposes and exalts himself above all <laughs> that is called God or that is worshipped, so he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Apostle Paul is telling the church in Thessalonica that the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is removed. <laughs> the church has to be removed first before the Antichrist can be revealed. Now, I'm going to ask you and preface what I'm about to say to you. Uh, if you would please be a Berean and search out what I'm about to say to you and see if it be true. I, I never want for you to take my word for it. I never want for you to, you know, especially when you're talking with others, say that, you know, the rapture of the church happens before the seven-year tribulation because that's what my pastor said. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> you, you need to know not only what you believe, but you need to know why you believe what you believe. So take these two words falling away out of your hip pocket. I want you to look at them for just a moment because in the original language of the New Testament Greek, <coughs> pardon me, it's the word apostia, apost apostasia, pardon me. It's where we get our word <coughs> apostasy. Now, in the original language of the Greek, it has two meanings. It means a turning away or and or a departing, a departure, if you prefer. Now, I believe, and I'm in good company, that this word apostasia, translated to English words falling away, that the Apostle Paul uses to this church in Thessalonica, is describing a twofold event that will take place first prior to the revealing of the Antichrist. The first thing it means is that there will be a falling away from the faith. That's what we understand it in the sense of an apostasy. But I also believe it means that it's the departing of those who are of the faith. It's the catching away. It's the departure slash rapture. And I believe that this is one of the most compelling arguments for the rapture having to take place before the seven-year tribulation. Again, it's not just that the rapture is before the tribulation. The rapture has to be before the tribulation. Otherwise, you would have to remove large portions of your Bible because you could not hold to any other view and still have a Bible which teaches that view. Now, I realize there are well-meaning Christians who believe otherwise, and they're certainly entitled to their own opinions because they're certainly entitled to be wrong. I say that in love. 
a rapture anywhere but at the beginning and before the seven-year tribulation is a truth that is clearly and explicitly taught in the scriptures. Now, in the interest of time, I'm unable to take the time to go into the reasons why the rapture has to happen before the tribulation, but suffice it to say, the situation in Egypt may have set in motion an unstoppable momentum in the fulfilling of Bible prophecy, so much so that we may actually be seeing, in part, many of the things that are beginning to come to pass prior to our departure at the rapture. Now, my prayer is that <coughs> at the conclusion of our time together today, <coughs> pardon me, in God's word, that all of us will have a renewed encouragement and a renewed hope. So having said that, I'll ask you at this time to turn to Psalm 83. We're going to unpack all the prophetic pieces to this prophecy puzzle and put together a clear picture of how it all plays out and ends up. Now, Psalm 83 is actually a prophecy that's <coughs> put to song by Asaph concerning a plot against Israel cunningly conspired to destroy them as a nation. Now, I think before we jump into this psalm, I would be remiss if I didn't recommend a book. Now, I don't usually recommend books, but there is a really good book on Psalm 83 by Bill Salas. It's titled Israel Stein. Uh, in it, he addresses Psalm 83 and really looks at how close we really are to its fulfillment. See, Psalm 83 is a, sort of a, the nexus, for lack of a better word. It's like that linchpin. And uh, present a fulfillment of Psalm 83, you create this momentum. It's almost that proverbial dominoes effect, even now as we see in Egypt, because the fear amongst uh, those who are watching very carefully, especially those in Israel, uh, it is believed that now Egypt will be the beginning of now Jordan following Saudi Arabia. Uh, tomorrow they are pr uh, planning protests in Iran again. Uh, this has really created a dynamic now in the Middle East, and I really see that it does have the makings to be uh, Psalm 83. You can also go to his website, israelstein.net, he has up-to-date articles on Psalm 83 and especially uh, related to the situation uh, in Egypt. I agree with him mostly. There's a couple of points, not major points, but uh, I, because I'm an Arab, because my dad was an Egyptian and my mom a so-called Palestinian, actually Jordanian or more probably an Edomite, as we'll see here in a little bit, um, I, I tend to... Uh, maybe hyper-scrutinize uh, Americans writing on the Middle East uh, from a Western perspective. I mean, these are uh, well-learned men, but there are some things that, unless you understand the culture in the Middle East, you just, you can't really, un in all fairness to them, you just cannot really understand, uh, you know, in terms of what's really going on over there. Now, please, don't, don't misunderstand me. I don't claim to... You know, be, you know, be in the know or, you know, have the corner on the Middle East. But uh, growing up in an Arab home and uh, hearing my dad talk about Egypt, uh, hearing him talk about the Middle East, uh, it sort of filled in some blanks for me, especially as I came to the Lord later in life and, and I've been walking with Jesus Christ for so many years. And now I see what's happening in my homeland and I see what's happening with my people. I gotta uh, confess to you that as I'm watching this, uh, uh, you know, situation in Egypt, uh, those people are—I mean, they look like me. <laughs> Poor people, but uh, no, they—they they are my people. They are—they uh, look like my, Hosni Mubarak. Looks like my dad. If I, if I were to put a picture of my dad up on the screen, you would think that it was a, a, pic, a different picture that one you haven't seen of Hosni Mubarak. I mean, 
these are, and I have family in Egypt. I have an aunt in Giza, and my wife and I stayed with her when we uh, went to Egypt in 1997, and I have aunts and uncles there and, and family there. So this is kind of, you know, close to home, and I think maybe in part this is why I'm devoting our time today to look at this situation in Egypt and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Well, let's get into Psalm 83, beginning in verse 1. A song, a psalm of Asaph. O God, do not keep silent. Be not quiet, O God, be not still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning, they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation that the name of Israel be remembered no more. With one mind, they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom, verse 6, and the Ishmaelites of Moab, and the Hagrites, Gibal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia, with the people of Tyre. Even Assyria, verse 8, has joined them to lend strength to, to the descendants of Lot, Selah. Do to them, verse 9, as you did to Median, as you did to Sisera and Yabin at the river Kishon, who perished at Endor and became like refuse on the ground. Make their nobles like Arab and Zeb, all their princes like Zebbah and Zalmunna, who said, let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. Make them like tumbleweed, O my God, like chaff before the wind, as fire consumes the forest, or a flame <coughs> pardon me, sets the mountains ablaze. <coughs> so pursue them, with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame so that men will seek your name, O Lord. May they ever be ashamed <coughs> and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. What a powerful and prophetic and poignant psalm. I'm going to use Google Earth, and I'm going to, in so doing, attempt to identify the nationalities of those that are listed here in this psalm, specifically in verses 6 through 8. Now, I think it's incumbent on me to preface this by saying that as an Arab, there is a tremendous amount of confusion about who's who in the Middle East. So I kind of want to give you a thumbnail sketch here uh, and preface this before we get into this with an illustration as to the who's who in the Middle East. You have to understand that we do err when we make synonymous Arab with Muslim. The truth of the matter is, is that the largest Muslim population is found in Indonesia. Uh, Alex and Lily are from uh, Indonesia. It is a Muslim uh, country, and it is the largest populated Muslim country in the world, and it's not Arab. Also, Iran. We mistakenly assume that the Iranians are Arabs. They are Muslims, but they are not Arabs. Iran is a Muslim nation, but they are Persians. They speak not Arabic, they speak Farsi. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is a Persian, not an Arab, but they are Muslims. Now, when you get into Egypt, you might be surprised to know that really Egyptians are not technically Arabs. They are Egyptians. They are the ancient Egyptian race. So when you say Arab, you are really encompassing a large segment of the world's population who have over the generations become a melting pot of different people groups. Now it's important to say that because as we get into these people groups that are mentioned here in Psalm 83, there are distinctions 
that are made between many of these, what we would call today, Arab people groups. Now, uh, my father was an Egyptian. My mother was born in Jordan. However, after 1948, uh, my grandmother moved from Nazareth in Israel after statehood in Israel. And they, as they, a lot of the Arabs did, they uh, left Israel after 1948 and moved uh, to uh, Jordan. And so today, really, <laughs> I guess you could say, theoretically, the Palestinians do have a state. It's called Jordan. <laughs> That's, you want a Palestinian state? Go to Jordan, my goodness. It's, uh, that's where all of them are. And by the way, Jordan, as we'll see here momentarily, is mentioned here in Psalm 83 in a couple of places. Now, I want us to try to, as we look at Psalm 83 here uh, more closely, uh, I want us to try to clear up <coughs> some of the... <coughs> some of the confusion as it relates to the Middle East, particularly in the last days. Now, <coughs> Asaph lists 10 people groups in three verses, verses six through eight. And again, the common denominator with all of these 10 people groups that he distinguishes there, uh, we call them today, we just lump them all in as Arabs. Now. The Egyptians are like a purebred German shepherd. And the Arabs are, now listen, I, I don't have a better illustration than using dogs. And I, for, for those of you who love dogs and have dogs and your dogs have become your own kids, God bless you, okay? Um, I can't identify with you, so I'm just gonna use dogs as an illustration. But um, when you have mixed breeds, you have what we call a mutt. So am I calling Arabs mutts? Well, <laughs> yes, I guess so. Because see, they're a mixed breed of all of the Hittites and Jebusites and Moabites and Ammonites and Amalekites and flashlights and termites. And we're just gonna call them ites. But see, what we've done is we've lumped them all in together and we've just generically, collectively called them Arabs. And if you do that in Psalm 83, you're going to get confused. So can you just indulge me as I take you through Psalm 83? And we're going to look at all of these different people groups listed <coughs> by their ancient names. And their sole goal is to destroy the nation of Israel so that her name is remembered no more. Now, it's important to understand, as we'll see next, that every single one of them that are listed here in Psalm 83 either border Israel, are in Israel, or <coughs> are close in proximity to Israel. Let's look at the first one. We find it in verse 6, and we start off the list with the tents of Edom. Who are the tents of Edom? Well, these are <laughs> the Edomites. Who are the Edomites? Edom is another name for Esau. Remember Esau? He's the fraternal twin brother of Jacob. He is the father of the modern-day Edomites who have taken the name of the Palestinians but are really what we would consider to be, in part, not whole, modern-day Jordanians. I think it's interesting. And for those of you who went to Israel with us back in 2008 and then again in uh, 2010 last year, remember when we were in the bus and <laughs> we were driving by and we would see these uh, Bedouins, the nomads, in their tents. It's kind of interesting. There once in a while you'd see this tent and then right next to it was a Mercedes. Weird. <laughs> Those are Edomites. Those are the tents of Edomites. They are a Bedouin people. They are a nomadic people. They are an Arab people. 
and that's who they are. And you will find them predominantly in Jordan. And really, they, uh, you might remember this last trip uh, when we were driving along the uh, Israel-Jordan border. Remember the uh, security fence? And on the other side, I mean, it's just a, it's a spectacular, breathtaking uh, view. But, uh, and especially when you got in, into Israel proper and you would see uh, even, you know, like close to Bethlehem, you would see the tents of Edom. Those are Edomites. And they are mentioned here uh, as the first ones in verse 6. Now, after the tents of Edom, we have listed in verse 6 the Ishmaelites. Now, the Ishmaelites are primarily Arabs, descendants of Ishmael, who, remember Ishmael, he was the um, half-brother of Isaac. He was uh, born to Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant that Sarah, in her impatience, had Abraham... <coughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> well, you know, he had, her, she gave birth to Ishmael uh, about 10 years before uh, Isaac was born. And he is the father of the Ishmaelites. And so these are <coughs> the descendants of Ishmael. And they would make up primarily what we would know today as the area of modern day Egypt. Now, some believe that you would even spill over into uh, modern-day Saudi Arabia, which is the Arabian Peninsula. But if you look on this map, uh, you have Egypt here and Saudi Arabia here, and you will find the Ishmaelites there. This is speaking of Egypt. Now, the next one we have is Moab. These are the Moabites whom we today also refer to as the Palestinians. However, they are yet again another people group known as the modern-day Jordanians. So uh, Edomites, Moabites are Jordan. The next one in verse 6 are the Hagrites. Now, place close attention to this because there's a distinction between the Hagrites and the Ishmaelites. Um, the, now, some of your translations might say the Hagrins, and some have debated this and really questioned this and not identified this as being Egypt, but it is. These are the descendants of Hagar, Hagrites. Now, listen, there's a distinction between the Hagrites and the Ishmaelites, while both are modern-day Egyptians, Ishmael would go on to have many descendants, as would Hagar have many more children other than Ishmael from other than Father Abraham, and they are Hagrites, but not Ishmaelites. I hope that. Some of you are looking at me going, ha! <laughs> Can we just simplify it this way and say that the Hagrites and the Ishmaelites are Egypt? And they're listed here in Psalm 83 vis a vis Hagar and Ishmael. In verse 7, we have listed Gibal. Now, this is the area we know today as, again, in, now, by the way, when I say in part, that's because the map that the psalmist was looking at, well, let's put it, put it this way. Uh, Asaph did not have Google Earth, <laughs> right? The ancient boundaries of these countries, of these nations, of these people groups was very different and encompassed a very different area, in some cases a much larger area than the days in our day. See, it's hard, in, especially when you get into prophecies like Isaiah and uh, Psalm 83 and even Ezekiel 38 and Zechariah 12, and you have all these ancient 
names listed and you go to a modern day map, you've got to really sort of erase the boundaries and superimpose a template of these ancient uh, borders in order to better understand what the uh, prophecy is about and for whom this prophecy is about. But this is modern day Lebanon, chiefly the northern part of Lebanon, which, by the way, borders Syria. So that's who, in verse 7, Gibal is. Now we have Ammon. These are the Ammonites. And again, they're Jordanians, but they refer to themselves as the Palestinians. You have to understand that, uh, I hate to use this word, uh, but they've hijacked the Palestinian name. They're not really Palestinians, they're Ammonites. And we're about to see here shortly that uh, Philistia is mentioned separately and distinctly from those who would adopt and even hijack that Palestinian label. Now, the next one in verse 7 is Amalek. These are the Amalekites, and this actually encompasses a huge melting pot of Arab people groups encompassing the greater Middle East. Again, over the generations, they all intermarried, and they all had all, you know, these, these mixtures of all of these different uh, people groups, and so generically and collectively, again, we call them Arabs, but they do have Amalekites within those Arab people groups. Now, this is where in verse 7 we have Philistine or Palestine or Palestinian, if you will. It's found uh, here in verse 7 where it's mentioned as and listed as Philistia. Now, these are likely the descendants of the ancient Philistines, but... We need to be very careful in our identifying them exclusively as Palestinians. Now, Philistine is a transliteration of Palestine. To say that you are Philistine is a transliteration in the English to say you are Palestinian, see? Uh, well, my wife and I were in Jordan uh, we uh, got out of the airport, went into the cab. The first thing the cab driver asked me in Arabic was, Inta Philistia? In other words, are you a Philistine? Now, because I wanted to get to our hotel room safely, I was going to tell him whatever he wanted to know. <laughs> you know, the advantage of being a mutt is, if there's problems in Egypt, I'm not Egyptian that week. And when there's problems with the Palestinians, which is all the time, I'm not Palestinian, I'm Egyptian. No problem. Oh, you're just, you're Egyptian? No problem. Okay. Now if I say I'm Egyptian, it's got, you are? So these are likely the ancient Philistines, but <laughs> I would suggest to you that they are supremely Arab people who reside primarily in the Gaza Strip in Israel today. These are the Philistines or Palestinians, but they are again a melting pot of Arab people and not exclusively. You have to understand, Goliath was a Philistine. And the last time I uh, was in Israel with you and we saw the quote unquote uh, Palestinians, they weren't nine feet tall, which is a good thing, by the way. <laughs> now, the last one we have listed in verse 7 is Tyre. Now, this is clearly Lebanon, my birthplace. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and Tyre is modern-day Lebanon, but these people would border northern Israel. In other words, this is southern Lebanon. Now, what do we know to be true about southern Lebanon? Well, first of all, it's been completely taken over by Hezbollah, the way Gaza has been taken over by Hamas, both of whom are proxy terrorist organizations of Iran. 
Ahmadinejad has spent untold millions of dollars rebuilding these cities in southern Lebanon because it borders northern Israel, and it just so happens that it's a little bit easier to fire thousands of Kedusha rockets <laughs> out of you know, southern Lebanon uh, into northern Israel. This is Tyre, and they are listed here as well. Now, the last one on our list, and it's actually the only one in verse 8, is Assyria. Who's Assyria? Well, again, this covers a very wide area today that we would know as modern-day Syria, Iraq, and perhaps more significantly, Turkey. We'll talk about Turkey more later, but for our purpose now, this would include Syria and, of all places, Iraq. Now, remember, all of these people groups, all 10 of them, are either bordering Israel, in Israel, or close in proximity to Israel. Now, I want you to notice on this next slide, first of all, my really cool graphics. How cool is that? that would, I won't tell you how long it took me to do that, but <laughs> what I want you to notice here is how that all of these countries, and by the way, they're all Muslim. They're all Muslim. And they all surround Israel. Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, which is Hezbollah, Gaza, which is Hamas, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and last but certainly not least, Egypt. By the way, Egypt, the first Arab nation to make a peace agreement with Israel and the largest populated Arab nation on the planet, 80 plus million people. So this getting Egypt is key in this accomplishing of the sole goal of destroying Israel. You can't get to Israel unless you've got Egypt. Because if you control Egypt, you control the Middle East. And where Egypt goes, so too do all the other nations go. And this is the fear, and this is what you hear on the news. The big fear now is Jordan. This is why Abdullah did what he did. This is why Assad in Syria is doing what he's doing. This is why the royal family in Saudi Arabia isn't sleeping very well at night. Because they all fear that what happened there in Egypt will also happen there in their countries. Now, I want to suggest that we may in fact be <coughs> witnessing <coughs> the fulfillment of Psalm 83, starting with and in light of the recent events in Egypt. I'm even going to take it a step further and suggest the possibility that <coughs> pardon me, Psalm 83 is in concert with the surrounding people's prophecy in Zechariah 12. Now, we don't have the time to get into it, but some of you are uh, aware of it. Uh, in Zechariah 12, the prophecy is concerning Jerusalem and how God is going to make it a cup of trembling that the whole world, the surrounding peoples, which, by the way, is an interesting word in the original language of the Hebrew Old Testament, because as with many words, it's the same in the Arabic. It's ami, people, my people. In other words, that these surrounding people are not just going to be close geographically to Israel. They're going to be close genetically to Israel. And so these surrounding people now in this prophecy in Zechariah 12 will injure themselves by attempting to move the boundary stones of Jerusalem. See, Islam claims Jerusalem to be a holy site where Muhammad ascended uh, on his horse uh, where the Dome of the Rock currently is. There is a problem with that. You cannot find Jerusalem mentioned even one time by name in the Quran. So it is false and it is a farce. And I believe that this could be Zechariah 12 <coughs> in concert with Psalm 83. And I'll even 
insert Isaiah 17. Now, some of you are, you're already, your hair is hurting because I'm throwing all this stuff out. But uh, listen, I, I know you're a well-taught group and you understand when I say Isaiah 17, I'm talking about a prophecy concerning Damascus, the capital of Syria, that it will be brought to a ruinous heap. So it is very <laughs> possible that, <coughs> pardon me, I, uh, Isaiah 17, Zechariah 12, uh, and Psalm 83 will all take place in concert one with the other. Now, I'm going to take it even one step further. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that Psalm 83, Zechariah 12, Isaiah 17, Isaiah 19 in part, will bring about Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, what's Ezekiel 38 and 39 for the benefit of those who aren't uh, savvy? Uh, it is a prophecy, again, listing by their ancient names a, an alliance of nations who will strike Israel with a nuclear attack when she is dwelling safely without walls, bars, gates. Now, uh, the reason I believe that 83 Psalm 12 Zechariah, 19 Isaiah, 17 Isaiah will all in part or whole be fulfilled prior to Ezekiel 38 and 39 is because to a nation they are conspicuously absent from the Ezekiel 38 prophecy. In Ezekiel 38 you don't have Egypt, you don't have Jordan, you don't have Le uh, Lebanon, you don't have Syria, you don't have Iraq, you don't have all of these surrounding peoples that you have there <coughs> in Psalm 83. So in other words, <coughs> something must happen to them that would remove them from the equation, if you will, and thus explaining their absence from Ezekiel's prophecy. Now, one might argue that because Iran is involved in this wanting to wipe Israel off the map and uh, putting millions of dollars into Lebanon and funding Hezbollah and Hamas and, and even Turkey's involvement, uh, one might argue, well, uh, they're mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Well, yes, they are. And actually, uh, they are only involved in Ezekiel 38. Uh, pardon me, they're only involved in Psalm 83 by proxy. You know what I mean by that? In other words, they're kind of behind the scenes. After the Psalm 83 attack is met with failure, then the Ezekiel 38 alliance comes to the forefront. I want to address the Iran-Turkey alliance in the context of what has for long been held to believe that it would be a Russian-Iranian alliance. Now, there are some who are uh, now saying that really Russia is not involved in Ezekiel 38. And I can see where they get there. I'm just going to Again, this is where being an Arab and knowing at least a dialect of Arabic comes in handy. In Ezekiel 38, uh, they have taken Rosh and transliterated it as Rosh, Rasha. Okay, now listen, in Hebrew, Rosh is not a nation, it's a, it's a title. See, in, in Arabic, we don't use the sh sound, we use the s sound. So if I say Jesus, Yeshua, in Hebrew, Yeshua, in Arabic. Uh, Rosh, in Hebrew, Ras, in Arabic. It means head. It means head. Chief. If in Arabic I say to you, I, I have a headache, and I actually do, by the way. <laughs> um, I would say to you, Rasi, but Wajami. In other words, my ras, my head, is uh, hurting me, aching me. See, ras is the head of this alliance. That's who rash is. 
it's not a nation. It's not Russia. You know, you can't just do that. I mean, that's a really pretty weak Bible translation, by the way. But I do believe that Russia is still involved. However, Turkey is very involved with Iran, and I do not believe it has to be either or. I think it's all of the above. And we're seeing now Turkey aligning with Iran. And by the way, this is recent, very recent. And here's another thing that you need to be watching for because in Islam, you have Sunni and Shia Muslims. Uh, the Iranians are the Shia Muslims, the Shiite, and the uh, Saudi Arabians and uh, Jordan, these are Sunni Muslims. Now, there has existed heretofore a chasm between the two, but that is being removed and erased. And now you're watching Sunni and Shiite Muslim coming together under the banner of Islam. So this is all happening now again in real time. But in Psalm 83, Iran and Turkey are involved, I believe, only by proxy. Now, after Psalm 83 is uh, fulfilled, I believe then it will become the catalyst for Ezekiel 38. Okay, well, you're probably sitting here thinking, Pastor, thank you so much. That's a very uh, interesting presentation, uh, very impressive graphics. Uh, glad you think so. What in the world does this have to do with me? I mean, what in the world does this mean to me when my alarm clock goes off tomorrow morning and I go to work? I mean, how is what's happening clear across the other side of the planet in Cairo going to affect me here in Kaneohe? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> you asked, right? Well, this is why I titled today's teaching, What Egypt's Prophecy Means to Me. I titled it that because Egypt's prophecy has profound meaning to you and me. See, what's happening on the other side of the world in Egypt will affect our lives all the way over here on these beloved Hawaiian islands. I want to share with you four things that the Lord has put on my heart concerning what's happening in the world today and what it really means to us in our world today. The first one is that Egypt's prophecy means to me that the alarm has sounded and it's time to wake up and it's time to get ready. In Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul, verses 11 and 12, writes, Do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. In other words, to the church. This isn't to the non-believer. These are to the believers in Rome. I think it's a word for us today, in the church today. I think that as a whole, the Church of the United States of America is sleeping. I think we're drowsy spiritually. We're in a slumber spiritually. And when the Lord comes, it will become a, as a thief in the night. Because we're not ready. We're still sleeping. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I never in my wildest imaginations dreamed as long as I've been teaching Bible prophecy that I would be standing before a wonderful church like I am now. 
sharing about how Psalm 83 is actually being fulfilled in real time on our television screens. I think the clarion call is that we need to, because the night is nearly over and the day is almost here, get rid of those things that have taken up residence in our lives. Those deeds of darkness need to be put aside. Those things that don't belong in our lives. Perhaps they're the very things that are keeping us drowsy spiritually, distracted spiritually. I think the time has come. What's taking place in Egypt means to me that it's time to wake up. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 44, <clears throat> Jesus said, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. See, he will come as a thief in the night, and no man knows the day or the hour, but when it does come, it will come for some at an hour that they're not expecting him to come. Why? Because we're too caught up in the cares and the affairs of this life, the busyness of everyday life. We've taken our eyes off the Lord. Oh, sure, we are walking with the Lord. But are we ready for the Lord? Let me ask you, if the Lord were to come today, maybe this afternoon, maybe this week, are you ready? I hope so. I hope so. If you're not, you need to get ready. Because he's coming very soon. Luke 21, 28, a verse I quote all the time. I'm sure you're sick and tired of me quoting this verse, but Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. In other words, when you see what's happening in Egypt begin to come to pass, when you see prophecies like Psalm 83 and Isaiah 19 and Isaiah 17 and Zechariah 12 beginning to come to pass, and they find their ultimate fulfillment, in the tribulation, but they're beginning to come to pass, that means that it's time not only to wake up, but to stand up and to look up because your redemption is drawing near. I believe that the return of the Lord in the rapture of the church where he comes for us as his bride and takes us to that place in his father's house where he's been preparing for us, that where he is we may be also. I believe that it could happen at any time. Here's the second one. Egypt's prophecy means that it's time to let others know so they're ready. In 1 Peter 3.15, the apostle Peter says, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you <laughs> to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect. In other words, people are asking questions. They're seeking answers, and we're the ones that have the answer. Listen, I believe that we are on the cusp of perhaps one of the greatest opportunities to win many people to Jesus Christ as people see what's happening in the world and how the whole world is just really coming apart. Governments are falling and failing and I mean just everything is going crazy. Everything is collapsing and they're looking for answers and we're the ones that have the answers, we're the ones that have the hope, they need hope. We're the ones that have the hope. And that's the second thing. It's the third thing that I want to spend just a little bit of time on. What's happening in Egypt means to me that it's 
time to take heart and not give up hope. I know that perhaps some of you have been walking with the Lord for many years and quite frankly, you expected the Lord to come back before your teenagers got their driver's license and he didn't. <laughs> that was very discouraging to you. Of course, I'm praying that prayer too. <laughs> I got four years, so Lord, please, I, I'm begging you, come quickly. But sometimes we lose heart and we get discouraged and we think that he delays his coming. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 and 18 through 18, Paul says, according to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, precede those who have fallen asleep. <coughs> For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up, that's the rapture, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord <laughs> in the air. And so will we be with the Lord forever. And then he says, therefore, Encourage each other with these words. See, when I know that the rapture could happen at any time, I'm encouraged. As one said, I have no problems in my life right now that the rapture wouldn't solve. I'll give you a moment on that one, I know, but uh, think about that. Those financial problems, those Marriage problems? Oh, no, pardon me. I know you all have perfect Christian marriages. I'm talking about marriages on the mainland. All of those problems you have in your life, everything will be solved at the rapture. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. See, I think that the more heavenly-minded we are, the more earthly good it will be. Isaiah says, happy is he whose mind is stayed on thee. Another translation renders it, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. In Matthew 6, Jesus said that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is in heaven, then your investment is in heaven and you're heavenly minded. And you live with that hope and that encouragement and then you can take heart knowing that soon and very soon the Lord is coming and he will take you out of here and you will forever be with the Lord and you will have a new body. Not just that alone for me. I can't wait. <laughs> no more anything. None of that. It's all gone. And think about this. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ here this morning, that's what you have to look forward to. And it can happen at any time. At any time that trumpet could sound and you'll take your last breath here and your first breath with him in the air forever. See, when I have that to look forward to, it makes whatever I'm going through easier to get through because that's my hope and that's my future. 2 Timothy 4.8, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, <coughs> which the Lord, righteous, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. <coughs> Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Maybe you're here today thinking to yourself that it seems like it's been very long for his appearing. And you do long for his appearing, but did you know that it's okay to long for his appearing? And that there's a blessing to those, a crown of righteousness for those who long for him to come? In 1 John 
chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, the Apostle John wrote, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself <coughs> just as he is pure. Now, let me tell you what this does not mean. <laughs> This doesn't mean that Jesus is coming and, buddy, you better get your act together. This doesn't mean the Lord's coming and you better be righteous. You better be right. You better do right. See, our own righteousness, Isaiah says, will be as filthy rags. It doesn't say that. What it is saying is, is that when you long for his appearing... When you're ready for his coming, it will have the effect of purifying you. See, now you're looking at everything in your life through the lens of his soon return. You're looking at everything in your life through the lens of his imminent return at any time. It's this last one that we'll end with, the fourth one. Egypt's prophecy means that it's time to call upon and believe in Jesus Christ. In John 14, 29, Jesus said, <coughs> pardon me, now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. In other words, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens you'll believe. When you start seeing that which I told you was going to happen, happen, it's time for you to believe in me. In a moment, we're going to have the worship team come up and close us in worship and song. And as they do, maybe this would be a good time for you to call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Maybe for you, it's not that you need to be saved. You're already saved. You've already committed your life to Jesus Christ. You've already called upon the Lord. Maybe for you today, it's a wake-up call of sorts. And maybe you need to do some business with the Lord. Maybe this has been that eye-opening experience for you that has really convicted your heart. Not condemned, but convicted your heart. Maybe the Holy Spirit needs to search your heart and see if there be anything at all that's keeping you from hearing, knowing, loving him so that you're ready for him and his soon return. After we're done, there'll be some people up front here. They can answer questions for you. They can pray with you, pray for you. And you can leave here today a new creation in Christ. You can leave here today different than the way you came here today, and you can have the assurance of eternal life. Why don't you all stand? Loving Father in heaven, we're ever so thankful to you for your word, <coughs> for the prophecy in your word, for telling us what's going to happen in the future. Lord, to be that generation that witnesses these events take place in this, the last days, is exciting, but perhaps for some it's terrifying. Lord, I pray <coughs> that you'll move upon the hearts of anyone here today that is not ready for your return. 
And Lord, too, perhaps for one who has grown weary waiting for your return, that you would just encourage their hearts, renew their hope. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.